Okay, why don't we get started? <clears throat> there are more people that'll be coming, but <clears throat> we only have an hour and a half, so let's get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Arthur Samuelson, and I'm the program director at the Rowe Conference Center. Um, we're located in Western Massachusetts. We got a lot of plants where we are. Um, uh, let me introduce you to two of my colleagues, Fia Alexander, who is here to help Jen and any of you um, with any technical problems that you might be having. We have disabled the chat until there's time for questions, but you can direct message uh, Fia. And also uh, my colleague, uh, Max McBride, who will be um, <clears throat> replacing me when I retire in a couple of months. And Fia is in, uh, in New Hampshire and we are in Western, Ma Max and I are in Western Massachusetts. And uh, Jen is in Pennsylvania. And um, <clears throat> we've been here for about 100 years. Um, <clears throat> we run summer camps for kids as well as for, as well as for adults. And we run weekend programs on things that we think go into making for a flourishing life, which is why we exist. We want to help people live flourishing lives at any time in their life, at all points in their life. And that includes spirituality, um, personal growth. Um, all the creative arts, nature, and social change. Nature um, has always been at the heart of what we do. We are in a rustic rural environment um, to begin with. Um, and uh, over the years, since about 1974, we've been running these weekend programs and, and um, plants, herbs, and nature have always been at the very center of what we do. One of our um, most beloved uh, presenters was Pam Montgomery, um, who ran a program with us for many, many years uh, with some of what are now the, the senior people in the herb world, um, but then were young, uh, a program called Green Nations. And then, and a few years ago, um, I asked her to start doing a different kind of a program for us, which was one on plant communication. And she, it was really fascinating. Um, uh, and I asked her to come back now that we have reopened to do on-site programs as well as online programs. I asked her to come back and she said no, that she's too busy, but she wanted me to know about her protege, Jen Frey. And so I am delighted to be able to offer you Jen. Um, Jen is, uh, has been working for the last 15 years helping people connect more deeply with nature through plant communication. Um, she's got a book coming out uh, at the end of June called Communicating with Plants, Heart-Based Practices for Connecting with Plant Spirit. And this, this program tonight is really a sample of the longer program that Jen will be offering um, with us um, on the weekend of April 28th to April 30th. Um, it's five sessions during those days from Friday night until Sunday afternoon. And we are so, and, and I hope that after seeing her in this program that you will all line up to join us there because we are ready and, and, and excited to welcome people back on the ground. It's been a long time since uh, we had the, as many people as we used to have. And um, by April 28th, our snow should be gone too, I hope. We got about three feet of it last year. I hope, uh, I hope all of you were warm if you got your snow and, um, and, uh, and felt uh, good about not getting it if you didn't. Anyway, I wanna welcome Jen um, for this evening's program. Jen, welcome. Thank you so much, Arthur. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. I'm really excited. I always love to talk about plants. So, um, and plant communication is a huge passion of mine. So it's a joy to be here with you. Uh, before we begin though, I just wanna give a preemptive apology. I am recovering from COVID. So I'm gonna try my best to mute myself if I have to cough, but if I don't get there in time, I apologize. I hope it's not too loud for anybody. Um, and also before we begin, I have a couple questions for you. I just wanna know a little bit about the audience. So down at the bottom of your screen, you have the reactions button. So you can press there, do raise a hand or thumbs up. 
So I'm wondering how many of you already communicate with plants? See a couple unsures, but also some hand raises. Great, that's awesome. Great, and if you're unsure, my guess is yes. <laughs> All right, um, Bea, can you clear that? Thank you. So, uh, so now my other question is, how many of you think that it's um, being able to communicate with plants is bullshit? Uh, nobody, or at least nobody being brave enough. Great. Well, that's a first then. And I think it's because we're virtual because usually when we are, uh, when I'm in person, usually somebody brings their partner or a friend along and is like, we have to try to convince them um, but great, I'm glad that you all are already here and um, nobody's ready to sign me up for the insane asylum just yet. So um, let me, I want to share my screen with you. So let's get into that. All right, you can see it. Great. All right, so the big question is, um, why, why do we want to communicate with plants? Why am I so passionate about this? And honestly, an hour and a half is not enough time to cover that, but just a few reasons why is that plants are our ancestors. They've always been here way longer than humans have, and plants have always evolved before their animal counterpoints. And of course, plants are also incredibly intelligent, conscious beings. Plants are also great adapters. They know how to survive through all the many different earth changes and also adapt to their environment, which is something that we're needing to learn from during these big earth changes that we're experiencing. Plants know how to live in community. They always live surrounded by one another and they know how to work cooperatively with one another. Again, a big skill for us to learn at this time. One sec. <coughs> I'm sorry, um, my mute button moved on me. Sorry about that one. Plants are our evolutionary allies. As I said, you know, plants have always evolved before humans or before animals. And so they have started moving through these earth changes. They've already started to evolve and adapt and they can help us to learn how to evolve and adapt. On top of that, plants know their role, their role in this great big web of life, and they can help us remember because most of us as humans, we've forgotten who we are, who we really are, and why we are here, and what really the purpose is of life. And so plants can help us to remember that. If we, if we want to survive as, Arthur said in the opening to flourish, if we want to thrive, we really need to learn how to communicate with the more than human uh, relatives on this planet and particularly plants, but all beings that are here. That's how we learn to um, be in community. And plants also, the real reason why I'm so passionate about plant communication is that plants can give us the answers to any issues or questions. So in my mind, what I've been doing the last few years is going, like last year I taught plant communication to a, um, a group that was almost all people working as builders or architects, creating structures. They're not the typical people that I have in plant communication classes, which are usually herbalists and uh, healers, plant lovers. And the reason why I'm trying to broaden out there is that if we really want to thrive, we need to bring change in all areas and plants can help us no matter what our field is. Plants meet us exactly where we are and provide the information that we need at that time. So if our expertise is as an architect, plants can help us to learn how to build better buildings that fit into the environment. If our expertise is as a healer, plants can help us learn how to meet our clients and provide the necessary skills that they, our clients are going to require. If we want to be, if we're educators, plants can help us learn how to reach our children better, how to think at, uh, and look at problems in a different way. So this is why I'm so passionate about teaching 
uh, plant communication. So this is me with my paternal, my, sorry, my maternal grandfather. And so I just wanna tell you a little bit about my journey with plant communication. Um, I, so my, my maternal grandfather was an avid gardener, plant lover. He was a Methodist minister. And I say he chose that profession because it allowed him to spend six days out of the week in the garden with the plants. And that was his big love. And he taught me from a very young age that we need to ask permission before harvesting and we need to sing to the plants. My grandfather always had classical music playing in his greenhouse. And, um, and then my paternal grandparents, they taught me about that the best medicine is the medicine that we can grow. For them, most of that was vegetables. But from a young age, plants were a big part of my life. Also from a young age, I had always heard about people who could communicate with plants. And I hoped and dreamed that one day I would be that special person. I would be special enough to be able to communicate with plants. Into my 20s, I had my kids very young. I started my herbal studies and I started studying with teachers who would teach about plant communication. And some of them would teach me really um, challenging processes that to this day, I still have no idea what they were talking about. So it just convinced me that I wasn't one of those special people who know how to communicate with plants. Then in 2006, I believe it was, we were building, we had built actually a very tiny straw bale house. It was 675 square feet. And in that house were my two sons, my husband, myself, my then husband, and we took in my nephew who was six foot three. So it was a very, very small space with a lot of people. I homeschooled my kids. Every minute of the day, somebody needed something from me. And the only time of day that was mine was the very early mornings. So I would get up early in the morning and I'd go do my favorite activity, which is I'd harvest berries. And at the time, particularly since my nephew moved in with us, there were a lot of challenges going on in our lives. So as I would harvest the berries, I would start kind of run down. That's how my day started. I was just overwhelmed. And I would find that after harvesting, I would suddenly feel uplifted and I'd have solutions to whatever the problems were. Now, it took me a little too long to realize that what was happening was I was communicating with plants. Those answers to my problems were coming to me from actually mulberry at the time, but from the different plants that I was working with. So from that point on, it's been my great passion to help people realize that we can all communicate with plants. It's, it is our birthright, it's, it's innate in us. It's just that we've been cultured to think that we can't. So um, when I asked you the question at the beginning, of course, nobody said, nobody agreed that it's bullshit. So I appreciate that. But it was a trick question because the truth is that we all communicate with plants with every breath we take. Every time we eat food, we are communicating with plants. We're receiving information from them. Though what I'm talking about here is conscious communication. Um, so as I said, we're all born knowing how to communicate with plants. It is our birthright. And some of you already know how to do this as you raise your hands. So you don't even need tonight's talk, but maybe I can give you a little bit of tricks that can help you in your communication process. And for others, you might want some help after this, or maybe, um, maybe the tricks tonight can get you on that journey. And then I find that there are others that need a little bit more support along the way. And so it's for those people, well, it's for anybody who wants to spend a weekend with plants, but that's why I offer the weekend programs, is for anybody who just wants some guidance to delve deeply into the plants. And what we do during those weekend programs is we have a number of experiences where you get to try communicating with plants in different formats. And through that, again, my job is to help you overcome the conditioning, but also I've learned that I act as an interpreter. 
because so often we are communicating with plants, but we're not realizing it. So I'm there to help show you if you're sitting with a plant and you're wanting to fall asleep and the plant's valerian, the plant is trying to tell you something. For, for those of you who don't know, valerian is a plant that helps us to go to sleep. So, so often in the classes, I'm just helping to build um, confidence, but also helping to interpret the ways in which we communicate with plants. So before we can talk about plant communication, we need to talk about what is communication. So communication, when we break down that word, is communion or common union. And this is ideally what's happening when we communicate. We move into communion with whoever it is, whether it's another person, whether it's a plant, whether it's a dog, we're moving in, we're remembering our connection to one another. Of course, that's the ideal world. It doesn't always go that way. So I just wanna take a second and ask you each to think about a time that you had just an awful conversation or, or maybe you wouldn't even categorize it as awful, but you had one of those conversations where you each aren't listening to the other. You're not feeling heard, no matter what you say, it's not making sense to the other person or whatever they say isn't making sense to you and it's just getting more and more frustrating. So can you think about a situation like that? All right, now let's look at a different one. Let's look at an amazing conversation. So think about one of those conversations that just really lights you up, where you felt seen, where you felt connected, where for me, when I have these conversations, sometimes I pause and I think, this is it. This is what life is all about. So can you think about one of those conversations? You all remember a time that you felt connected. So what's the difference between those two? You might have your own thoughts about what it is. Here's a clue. It's your heart. It's the state of your heart. Oops, sorry, I went too fast. So we wanna talk about heart intelligence. When we're having those really amazing conversations, what's happening is our hearts are entrained. They're connected, they're united. And when we're in heart entrainment, Communication, information more easily flows between one another. If we could see it, there is a, an energetic laser beam that's connected between our heart and another person's heart. And when that's happening, we feel the connection. Again, information just naturally flows. Our hearts, well, maybe you already know this, our hearts are the largest oscillator in our bodies. So the the electromagnetic field of them can be measured way outside of our physical body. I've heard different lengths of, of space, but it can be measured far. And as the largest oscillator, they bring, if our heart's in coherence, it helps to bring someone else's heart into coherence. If we think back to elementary school when you learned about pendulums and you'd go into a room of pendulums and you can start setting them off in different ways, um, the largest pendulum will end up bringing the other ones, all of the other pendulums into that rhythm. And that's what the heart is. The heart is that largest pendulum, helping to bring our bodies back into rhythm, as well as helping to bring, as I said, other people's bodies into rhythm. So if we can focus on heart, getting our hearts into coherence, or what we call um, heart coherence, heart space, getting into our heart space, then it allows us to entrain more easily with somebody else's heart, allowing those amazing conversations to go through. I often say when I'm teaching these classes, plant communication classes, that I could repackage them as relationship classes because at the heart of the matter is our hearts, the, the foundation for good, clear, great communication is getting into your heart space, getting into a heart, a coherent heart. 
So what are benefits of heart coherence? Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of HeartMath before. They're a great organization in California who's been studying the heart for over 30 years. And um, thanks to them, we have lots of scientific evidence. So there's, there's physiological benefits, not just emotional benefits to heart coherence. And one of them is that our cortisol levels drop when we are in heart coherence. Our, the DEH or the um, aging hormone also uh, drops. Um, we are breathing slows. I normally find my shoulders can drop sometimes inches, unfortunately, but they drop, they relax. Our bodies calm down. We become happier. It it's becomes easier for us to experience a state of bliss. Um, we also become more solution oriented and um, creative. So problems, things that we thought were huge problems suddenly become easy. They become opportunities to us. So being in this heart coherence uh, state is really important. Another aspect of it is that we move into a receptive mode, which means we're more able to receive information. Therefore, if we want to communicate with plants, we want to be able to be in this heart coherent mode. But also if we want to have good communication with other people, it's helpful for us to be in this heart coherent mode because we're more receptive. We can hear, really hear what people are trying to say to us. So how do we get into a heart coherent state? Well, again, thanks to the great people at HeartMath, we know that there are positive heart impulses. These are joy, trust, gratitude, innocent perception, um, playfulness, forgiveness, compassion, and appreciation. So I always separate gratitude and appreciation in heart math, they refer to appreciation as gratitude. But to me, gratitude is, of course, being grateful for the plants that they give us our very life, being grateful for the food on our table, being grateful for our friends. And appreciation to me is a little bit different. It's, it's more personal. So it's when you see that stranger on the street and you say, oh, I love your purple hair. And they just light up. Or you, you turn to your good friend and you're like, I love it when you smile. When you smile, it just lights up my world. And so the trick there is that when we're doing that, we think we're giving a gift to the stranger or to our friend. But the truth is that we're getting a gift too because it's putting our hearts back into coherence. And the more we experience that, the easier it is to stay in a coherent state the easier it is to experience all the other positive benefits. So I always say the trick for a happy life is just to engage in more appreciation. So having said that, we're going to do um, a, just a brief um, experience, if you all are willing to, to um, close your eyes and just start listing what you are grateful for. And maybe you can get to let's say 10 things. And if you're struggling, as I, I already gave some examples, we can be grateful for the breath of life, grateful for the sun that shines so sweetly on us, grateful for the sky above and the birds who are singing spring in. And just start listing some more things that you are grateful for. And as you are listing them, notice how your body's responding. So I already gave you some ideas of how your body might respond. Like I said, my shoulders drop, my breathing slows. But also for you, there might be special sensations. So really notice them because those are your clues that you're in a heart coherent state. Some other ways that my body responds is my hands feel like I'm wearing Mickey Mouse gloves and my feet feel like I'm wearing clown shoes. Sometimes I'll actually feel my heart 
open. And sometimes that can be painful. It's like I'm stretching all those heart muscles. So again, it's important that we start to recognize what these sensations are for us because it lets us know, oh, I'm in my heart space. So we just wanna do a quick review on communication. Again, good communication occurs through heart entrainment and heart coherence is essential for good heart entrainment. If we are having one of those challenging conversations where we're just not getting to um, understand one another, we can pause, we can do this gratitude exercise and work on getting ourselves back into that heart coherence. And then once we're there, we can look to the person that we are talking with, look in their eyes. If we have a relationship that it's safe to touch, we could just lightly touch their hand or their arm. We can breathe consciously and slowly. We could give them an act of appreciation, or we could remember a moment that we shared together, a memory that was just really fun. And by doing that, it helps to bring us into heart entrainment with one another. And of course, we can increase our heart, our own heart coherence by engaging in all the positive heart impulses, experiencing forgiveness engaging in compassion, trusting the world around us, engaging in activities of joy and innocent perception, which just in case that's a new term for you, innocent perception means looking at the world like the eyes of a child. So when we see a dandelion, we don't say like, oh, dandelion, I know all about you. You're a really great liver herb and your leaves are really good for the kidneys and your um, the wishy balls, we love to blow on you. Instead, we look at dandelion like, oh my gosh, dandelion, how gorgeous are you? You're like, you're such a beautiful golden flower. And it's as if it's the first time we see them. So whenever we engage in the world with innocent perception, it just opens us up to wonder and puts us into that heart coherent state. And of course, also um, gratitude, appreciation, and then putting ourselves in situations that are likely to to bring about the sensation of bliss. All of that helps us to have a more heart coherent space. So one last thing about communicating before we talk about plant communicates, plant communication is we wanna talk about how do we communicate? Because so often when I talk about plant communication, everybody thinks I'm talking about Moses and the burning bush scenario. Like I'm walking out of my house and some bush starts yelling, hey, Jen, you left the oven on. And that's just not generally the experience. Some people have those experiences, but it's not the most common experience to communicate with plants. And it's also when we talk about communication with humans, we think about the verbal and the audio. And that is true. That's a great way of communicating. But as you can see, this is a picture of our little niece here. You can very clearly see that she is trying to tell us something in this picture. She is communicating that she is not happy. So our body language actually tells us so much more. A person's posture, how they move throughout the world. Of course, signs, we can communicate with signs. Um, if you've ever had teenagers, then you learn the great language of grunts and how to communicate using grunts or interpreting grunts. Of course, we can communicate with gifts and we communicate through exchanging energy. And these are just some of the ways that we communicate. But mostly I want us to realize that when we're talking about communication, we want a real broad definition. And the same is true for plants. We really, we're talking about um, receiving information. That's what we mean by communication, receiving information, moving into that union. So we want the broad definition. So a few things to know that will help us with communicating with plants. So one is that plants are intelligent. They are incredibly conscious beings and they are connected to the wisdom of the universe. So by communicating with them, we have access to that wisdom as well. We have an innate, deep kinship with plants. Our very lives depend on them from the breath we breathe 
to the food we eat, to the shelter. We have this innate deep kinship. This uh, gentleman in this picture is Bob and he's 88 here. And he had his first experience of consciously communicating with plants last year, again, at the age of 88 during our maple initiation. So there's no, um, it's never too late to learn this or to remember it really. Plants want to be in relationship with us. That's a really key part. Not everybody um, no, understands that, but when they come to learn that, it shifts your worldview when you start to look outside your window or start to go on a walk and realize that plants want to be in relationship with you. In fact, often when people start to learn how to consciously communicate with plants, they get overwhelmed because all the plants are like, pick me, pick me, and they're jumping up and down and we can only communicate with so many at a time. So, um, but plants want to be in relationship with us. And on top of that, when we create a relationship with the plant, when we communicate with a plant, we are creating a unique relationship. So just like you might have a different relationship with a friend than another friend has, or with a child than what your partner has with your child, it's the same way with plants. Plants meet us exactly where we need to be. So if we have a whole group of people who are all communicating with the same, let's say, oak tree, we, at the end of the day, when we're sharing everything, there will be a common core theme of information that we received, but yet each individual person might receive special gifts because it's what they needed at that time. The beauty of that means that we can continue to communicate with these plants throughout our entire lives and still constantly be learning from them. I've been working with plants. Well, again, it's been a little over 15 years that I've been consciously communicating with them. And I'm still continually learning from some of my early first beloved plants. So the first step in communicating with a plant is to sit with them. You see who's calling you and sit with this plant. And while you're there, you want to be like Buddha here and get into your heart coherence. Plants excel at entrainment. So if all we need to do is to get into our heart coherence and then the plants will fine tune themselves so that we're on the same channel and that communication can flow like the laser beam between us. While we're there, we might wanna breathe and just calm ourselves down. We also want to become super observant. Be patient and observant as we're sitting there with the plant. Notice everything. Everything matters, everything counts. And at the beginning, we don't assign meaning to anything. We're just noticing, we're just observing. I say you wanna be like Sherlock Holmes. Notice the most minute thing. What thoughts are coming into your head? You might even have some silly song from back when you were a child come into your head. We write it down. Notice how your body's feeling. Notice if there's ants crawling on you. Um, in this picture is our cat, Johnny. So, you know, notice if cats are coming towards you, what's happening with the birds? Notice everything. Um, and especially notice your first impressions. That first impression of a plant is the most important. We call it the first voice. While you're sitting there, you also want to pay attention to any feelings or sometimes you'll have memories come up. Notice it. Again, not assigning meaning. We'll have time for that and we'll talk about it. Um, but for now, we just want to collect information. And part of that is also noticing what's going on around you. Sometimes you'll find the sound changes around you. Maybe the sound gets really loud or the sound gets really quiet, or sometimes I'm communicating with plants and it feels like every truck in the county is going by the house right then. Um, it's all important. So we just observe it. But also noticing what's going on around you, sometimes a memory will come in or a thought will come in. And just as you think it, a big breeze goes by or a bird chirps. And sometimes those are little signs of nature, just giving little emphasis to those messages. Okay. 
you want to look closely. In this picture, he's using a loop or a magnifying glass. And so again, this is that innocent perception. We want to look at the plant in all ways. Sometimes there's, um, he's looking at St. John's wort here. And so if you squeeze St. John's wort, which is a yellow flower, your fingers turn purplish. So sometimes there's hidden secrets when we look closely. Looking at the pollen of a, of a flower can be incredible. It's like little fireworks almost. Um, other times, um, I'm thinking of a time I, an experience I had with Black Eyed Susan, where I kept feeling Black Eyed Susan at the crown of my head. And it didn't make sense because I was thinking about Black Eyed Susan. I wasn't engaged with the innocent perception. And then later when I looked closely, I saw that the inside of the Black Eyed Susan was actually purple. So that and purple is connected in with our crown chakra. So suddenly it made sense as to why I was feeling sensations there. So again, we wanna look closely and look with innocent perception. We wanna sing with the plants. So there are tones that we do that are connected in with the chakras. So we can sing those to the plant and see how the plant responds. And often there'll be one tone that they like more than the others and it gives us information. But we also just sing and see how the plant responds or see what happens with the song as we're singing or sometimes we'll play instruments for them. And here, the goal isn't performance. It doesn't matter if your music teacher told you that your voice isn't any good. I, I've never had a plant complain about my voice. They love to hear us sing. So we just wanna sing and see what happens. We wanna dance with the plant. And no, you don't have to be a ballerina. I just saw this picture and thought it was gorgeous. Um, but dance, again, we have these bodies. We're able to move them more than the plants are able to move their bodies. So they love it when we dance for them. So one, it's a gift to them, but two, as we dance with them, it helps us to come into that coherence again and see what comes forward as we're dancing. Are we feeling more um, playful or do we need to do loud thumps? Do we need to like, do huge movements or small movements? Just pay attention to what happens. You never know what can come forward just by dancing with the plant. One of the biggest core parts of communicating with plants is engaging in reciprocity. So reciprocity is an honoring of giving gratitude, thanking the plants for all that they give us. So there are different ways of engaging in reciprocity. Um, in this picture, this is a plant, we did a initiation with the cedar plant. And so everybody put little gifts there and sure we can give them gifts, but there are many ways. Um, sometimes, again, singing for a plant is a gift of reciprocity, dancing with the plant. Sometimes we need to plant other plants there, or um, we need to speak up for the plants can be a gift of reciprocity. And it's always good to ask the plant what they would like. But however, whatever we do, whenever we communicate with the plant, we want to be sure to give them gifts of reciprocity, just honoring all the generous gifts that they give to us in our lives and all the many ways that they support us. We wanna draw the plant. And again, this isn't an artistic um, endeavor. We're not going for Picasso. We're not going for a detailed botanical drawing though this is a, a dear friend of mine who um, did drawings for my book and she is doing a botanical drawing there. So if you're inclined to do that, that's great. But just draw the plant. See what you see. One of my favorite ways of drawing the plant is to um, put a, a pen or a pe pencil on the paper and I close my eyes. I'm sorry, I don't close my eyes. I put a pen or a pencil on paper. I look at the plant, I pick a point, And from there, I never look down at the paper. I keep my, my eyes on the plant and keep the pen on the paper. And so you're doing, sometimes it's called a contour drawing. And it's amazing at the end, when you're done, you look, oftentimes you do get a form of a plant. But the whole point of drawing with the plant is it gives you more information, something that you might not have seen otherwise. You can also draw your experience. So this is a painting. I am not an artist, but this is a painting I did with the ginkgo plant that I was working with. 
And this is obviously not the ginkgo plant, but it's my experience that happened as I was working with ginkgo and it relays information to me. So that's another thing you can do is draw your experience. And I didn't know that's what I was starting out to draw. It's just, you start drawing it and see what's coming forward. Daydream with the plant. This is one of my favorite ways of communicating with plants. And the reason is, as you can see, these are some of my students. It looks like they're taking naps, but they're not. They're really engaged in deep communication. And so when we daydream with the plant, what we're doing is we're, we want to lay as close to the plant as we can get. And we let our body just sink down into the earth. Again, we're in heart coherence. We're calming ourselves and we're sinking down into the earth and we're actually going into the field with the plant. So we're starting to sense the world as the plant senses. And it's amazing the information that comes through. It's one of my most effective ways for communicating with plants and I get to lay there. So I love it. Ask a question. This is one of the cores for plant communication, which so many people don't even think about. They, but it, the plants will give us the answers that we want, or not necessarily the answers that we want, but the, they'll answer the questions that we want the answers to. But we have to ask. So sometimes if there's something weighing on us, you want to go ask your plant and say, what do I do about this? If I have classes that I want to create, I go to the plants and I ask. Um, if you're, I mean, you could ask them, what should you make for dinner? They'll probably help you, but it might not be the most effective way for communicating with them. But ask plants questions. Another one of my favorite ways for communicating with plants is through a shamanic journey. And sometimes I refer to this as a sound journey. So in this, we're using normally a drum. Sometimes we'll use a rattle um, or another form of sound. And what we're doing in that is we're moving out of um, beta into theta waves. So that's, we're moving into the dream state where we're again, more receptive. We're able to just simply know the information. And with the plants, what we do is we do a journey to meet the plant spirit of whoever we're communicating with and ask questions or simply spend time with them and see what information we receive. We ask for a dream. This is important. It's another great way of communicating with plants. But with this, uh, just because you ask for a dream doesn't mean that the, the dream the plant gives you contains the plant. So for instance, one of my students, Wendy is an excellent dreamer and she was working with uh, Bleeding Heart the one time. And she had a dream. She asked Bleeding Heart for a dream and Bleeding Heart came to her and showed her, she was actually at Pam's place where Arthur had mentioned before. And she saw all these bulldozers coming through Pam's and just tearing down all the trees. And it was really um, nerve wracking. She didn't quite understand it. So what Bleeding Heart was doing in that instance was showing her that when your world is just getting wrecked, when things are getting torn down all around you, Bleeding heart is the plant to turn to. Bleeding heart is there to help support our hearts when our hearts can't hold the pain anymore. So in this case, bleeding heart um, themselves never appeared in the dream, but was giving the message through the dream. Use your senses. This is another fun way. They're all fun ways of communicating with plants, but I'm a nibbler. I love to go around the world and taste little things. So if you know your plant's not poisonous, we take a little bite and we chew it very slowly. And we again notice what's happening in our body. What do we notice as we take this bite? There's sensations going on in our mouth and all of that can give us information. We of course wanna smell the plants, right? Like smell is so powerful. Uh, Talsi is a great one for thinking of smell. When we smell Talsi, Talsi just puts me into a whole other realm, puts me into that bliss state. What do we, what happens when we smell the plant? We want to touch the plant. Like everyone else, we always ask permission before touching them, but touch them gently. What happens as we touch the plants? Uh, I worked with nettle a few years ago and just lightly caressed nettle, stinging nettle that is, and it was the most ecstatic experience. So 
If the plants agree, touching them is fabulous. Um, and of course, this beautiful rose is giving us another area to look at them and that's the color. We wanna notice the color and again, through innocent perception. So what, what do we feel? Where do we feel that color in our body? What, what is that color telling us? And there may be different aspects to the plant that we can't see at that time. For instance, blood roots, the roots are red. So the, the roots give us information or golden uh, seal, you know, the roots are yellow. They give us information. And while we might not wanna dig up those plants, we could look for pictures and um, just looking at all the different forms of color of the plant. Dieting the plant, another favorite. So there's, this is a term, plant diet or dieting plant that has a number of meanings. And what I mean by this is when you're working with a plant, like in this case, dandelion, we eat dandelion in as many forms as we can. We, have, we make dandelion root tea. We uh, will have dandelion wine. We'll have a tincture of the whole plant of dandelion. We'll have dandelion leaf tea. We'll marinate the leaves. We'll try dandelion essence. Uh, in my classes, I, I transmute the, the plant spirit of the plant. So I would give you dandelion plant spirit. And we try all these different forms of the medicines, sometimes one right after another. Sometimes you just take one for a day or you might do it for a whole week and see how each of those forms affects us. What are we noticing as we are ingesting these different parts of the plant? And then we can listen to the plant sing. This is um, the picture here shows a little device that comes from Damanhur, Italy. And it translates the electrical impulse of the plant into musical notes. So let's see if now you can't hear it. Sorry. Well, I'm sorry you can't hear it. Um, maybe we can uh, share a link or something through on the, the page. But also, I have if you go to my website, which is bridgetsway.com, I have a, a YouTube link. And there's lots of videos on YouTube that you can listen to them. Because um, I really want you to hear the plants play. It's so beautiful. Um, and again, it's one of our... Uh, forms of communication. And so what we do is we listen to them and we again, notice what's happening in our body. And then essences, taking a flower essence or I call them spirit essence, taking it can inform us, but also making an essence with the plant in that process. It's this huge, incredible connection and we can receive so much information just through the making of the essence. And then one of my absolute favorite ways of communicating with plants is called a process called green breath. And this comes from my teacher, Pam Montgomery. Um, she developed this years ago through with white pine. And what we do, it's a 72 minute long journey that's uh, set to music and it's guided throughout and there's breathing techniques and you work with a particular plant. So in my classes, often we're working with um, the same plant, but sometimes each person has their own. And, um, and in that time period, the whole point of green breath is to get to the point where there's no separation between us and our plant ally. And so we just really become one and we are connected and we receive so much healing and um, information and it's just, a profound life-altering experience. So I always say, if you ever have an opportunity of experiencing green breath, you most definitely wanna do it. Um, so after we have all these different experiences, we want, that's when we bring in discernment. 
we don't want to sermon in the beginning because we'll start our monkey minds will take over and we'll start crossing off things and saying, oh, that couldn't possibly be true. It happens all the time in my classes. People um, went at the end when we start putting the stories together and sometimes I'll help them with their plants and I'll offer them something that I know about this plant. They're like, oh, yeah, I received that, but I didn't think that was true. So I just ignored it. So at the end, after we have all these different experiences and we want to have multiple experiences, so we just get to know the plant in different ways and also learn different ways of receiving information from the plant. After we have all of that, then we do, we put together what I call the plant story. And we start to pull together the common themes. What are the themes that we're repeating? What are the patterns that we noticed? What are messages that without a doubt were very clear to us? And then we also notice that there are ones that might feel a little too, too strange to us. And for those, we maybe we put a question mark on them. And then after we've created our plant story from our experience, then we can go look to the books or to the internet and see what other people have said about this plant. We don't wanna do it beforehand because each plant um, could have their own encyclopedia written about them. So if we're just looking to see what somebody says about dandelion, like Matt Wood's Book of Herbal Wisdom is one of my favorite herb books. And the reason is because he has a whole chapter on a plant. Most books only have a paragraph. But even Matt Wood's book, the chapter that he has on dandelion, dandelion has so much more to teach than what's in that book. So we we don't wanna limit ourselves by other people's experience. Cause again, this is about our unique relationship with the plant and what gifts are the plants giving us. But now we can create discernment and start to put that story together and start to know the plant more. But that's not the end of our journey because again, we can communicate with these plants for a lifelong journey. And so it's just the beginning. Then if we wanna go deeper, we wanna have ceremony with the plants. And one, one of the great ways of doing it is through a sacred plant initiation. So with the plant initiation, what we do is we focus on a, a one plant for the whole weekend. And we, will, we create a special elixir um, with that plant and we ingest that throughout the weekend. Otherwise we fast, generally. It's, not, it's suggested, it's not required and we have ceremony all weekend long. So again, the whole point of sacred plant initiation is at the end that there's just no separation between us and the plants. So one of my teachers, Carol Guyette, has a book written called Sacred Plant Initiation. And she's the one who's really bringing forward the concept of being initiated by common plants. We, we know about working with psychotropic plants like ayahuasca or, or peyote but we can receive the incredible information and wisdom through, this is self-heal, um, which if you don't know self-heal, you probably wouldn't notice the plant growing in your yard, just a real tiny plant. So we can receive profound healings and informations from these plants. And one of the reasons why Carol and the plants are bringing this forward now is because as humans, we've lost so many of our, um, our ancient memories and our forms of initiation. And so the plants are now stepping forward to help initiate us into what it means to truly be human or what we call sacred humans, remembering our part in all of nature. So uh, I just gave you some information on ways in which you can go and communicate with plants. But if you would like to go deeper, here's some more suggestions. The easiest way to um, go deeper with plant communication is to sit with a plant. Spend the time to sit and listen to a plant. Be willing to be considered crazy and just see what happens. Just what if, what if the plant could communicate to you? What would you be hearing? So I have the law of three here. And the law of three is that if a plant crosses your path three times, that's the universe trying to get your attention. You don't have to wait three times, but if one happens three times, you wanna pay attention. So I have orchid here because it's one of my favorite examples was with one of my students. She lives in Pittsburgh. And um, I don't know if anybody's been to Phipps Conservatory, but it's a beautiful conservatory. 
and she would go there for her lunch to the orchid show. And so she was there at lunch, enjoying the orchids and she's leaving, it's the middle of winter, there's snow all around. And as she's walking back to work, here there's an orchid on the ground in front of her. Now, there's no reason that there should be an orchid on the ground in, in Pittsburgh in the middle of winter. So she picks it up, notices it, thinks that's interesting. And then she gets to work and there was a luncheon there and there was leftovers. So she goes to get some salad. And as she's about to eat, she sees there's an orchid in her salad which had never happened before. So that was her clue that Orchid was trying to get her attention. And sure enough, she communicated with Orchid and had a beautiful um, meeting with them. But the point is, is that if a plant crosses your path three times, sometimes really common ways, sometimes very strange ways, it's trying to get your attention and pay attention. Another great way to deepen your connection and to experience communicating with plants is to join us for this weekend at Row. Well, it's not, it's virtual through Row, April 28th to the 30th. So during that weekend, what I'll do is I'll take you through um, some of the experiences I already named and you'll go and you'll work with one plant for the whole weekend and have these experiences. And then we'll come back and we'll share. And again, I'll help you interpret them, help you understand what, what was going on, what you may have been experiencing, answering any questions, guide you along the way. The beauty of this being a virtual class is that you get to communicate with a plant that you already know. Uh, the first time I taught this virtually, I, I, it was actually because of COVID and I didn't want to. I was so upset that I had to teach plant communication virtually but it was such a profound experience and people were coming in and they were talking to a tree that they've loved for 30 years or somebody else just moved to a, a new place and now she made a good friend with a plant growing right outside her doorstep. And it's just, it was so incredible to see people talking to these plants that have real meaning to their lives. And so I'm excited. I'm really excited to be able to offer it this virtual again. So I hope you join us again, April 28th to 30th. And then I also have, my book is coming out, as Arthur mentioned, uh, June 26th. And this is Communicating with Plants, Heart-Based Practices for Connecting with plants, spirit, plant Spirits. So in this book, I talk about my own experiences with the plants and messages that I've received, but also at the end of each chapter is an exercise that's geared towards guiding you through plant communication. It's written as if you were attending one of my classes. So you get the guidance, but you don't get all the personal advice that happens in a weekend workshop. And this is my website, bridgetsway.com. My email's there, janetbridgetsway.com. Please, we, we are gonna have time for questions, but please feel free to email me if, with any questions. And also, um, if you go to my website, I will be putting up some more classes soon. And I have, I do have a mailing list. And if you sign up for it, I send you a free ebook on energy hygiene. So, um, which I find to be really helpful with my clients. And one last suggestion is I'm also on the visioning council for the organization of nature evolutionaries. And we have a wealth of information on our website. We have interviews, we have articles, we often have classes and all of it is geared towards co-creative partnership and deepening your connection with nature. So please do feel free to check it out. Most of our offerings are free and we just wanna um, help share. So with that in mind, I'm gonna stop share and we'll see if you have any questions. Yeah, do you want to? Is there any um, Carrie Stendhal has a question. Dorf has a question. Oh. You can unmute, Carrie. Thank you. Oh, this was wonderful, Jen. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> well, the law of three really um, spoke to me, um, and I brought home a beautiful orchid from the New York Botanical Garden. Um, uh, in February, when I took myself uh, out on my birthday, I went to the orchid show and one particular orchid kept drawing my attention. And I'm not usually that 
I'm more attracted to color. This was a white blossom, but it, um, I couldn't stop taking pictures of it. <laughs> so when I went to this garden shop, uh, there it was, and uh, it took me half an hour to decide, but yes, I brought that one home. I have another orchid at home that I've had for many years. And I'm sure many folks who feel like they communicate with plants have to preface this, that I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I'm, I would love to do some of these activities with my new orchid, um, but I wonder if my other orchid will get jealous with that attention and um, it, am I overthinking things uh, or is there a way to um, be sure that I can spend that time with my plant in the plant room because it's quite a lovely space. I don't really feel like I want to take it to another part of the house. So could you um, talk a little bit about that, the relationship of plants to each other and to people who come into their space or more like house plants, really? I mean, I'm caring for them as opposed to out in nature. Yeah, so there is a lot there, Carrie, actually, and thank you for bringing it forward. So one, before I want to, I will answer your question, but before I get there, I just want to say that what you are noticing with the plant um, that you just couldn't turn your eyes off of the plant and they were really calling you, that is the plant trying to get your attention. That's the plant saying that they wanna be in relationship with you. So, so often we discredit that. We just think, oh, it's because the plant's beautiful or the plant's special or you know, everybody, everybody would notice this plant, but it's not. It's that the plant wants to be in relationship with you. So um, will the other plant get jealous? I'm gonna say no, though they are orchids. And what I've learned from um, doing the music of the plants is that orchids tend to be divas. <laughs> they do like to be in the limelight, <laughs> but I've never had a plant jealous because I was communicating with another one. I have had multiple plants want to talk to me at the same time, like I mentioned. And what I do then is I just say, I hear you, I want to communicate with you, but I can only do one at a time. And so, what I do is I ask who is it most important that I communicate with right now. Um, but it feels like to me that you're getting called to work with that plant. So I say, go have fun. And then, you know, you can go communicate with the other plant too. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. There, there is a question in the chat, Jen. It says, what are some examples of messages can you give that you've heard, whether personal or collective? Oh my gosh. Well, there's lots. <laughs> and of course, you know, my brain, like everything flies out. But, um, well, so for me, for, as far as collective, you know, we all went through this, this um, real challenge of COVID time period, right? And so for me, what I do whenever I'm challenged is I immediately go out to the plants. So whenever um, I know I have not been spending enough time in nature or with the plants when I'm feeling frustrated. So for me, my uh, white pines are one of my big allies. So I go out to the white pine and what white pine always was telling me during COVID is just, it's all okay. I mean, the plants tell us that all the time. Everything is okay, calm down. You know, they, the plants hold that long vision of the future. And so whenever, whenever we're freaking out, it's because we think that whatever it is that we're experiencing at this moment, is going to be the same thing that we're gonna experience for the rest of our lives. And so the plants just try to give us that bigger perspective. Um, other messages, I mean, it's such a hard question <laughs> because there's so many messages, it's like, um, it's like, what messages did your beloved give you? You know, they, they, they tell me so much. Um, sometimes they show me ways in which I can help heal my clients. Um, I talked about Black Eyed Susan earlier, and that plant really gave me some uh, important information on how to help my clients move out of their trauma stories, how to shift their, their experience with their trauma so that it no longer is carrying in their life. Um, on my personal, the plants have shown me where to move. You know, this house here where I am now, it's because the plants pointed the way. Um, they've shown me 
uh, to have faith when I was wanting a partner and he wasn't showing up. And then lo and behold, they showed, I've had plants tell me um, that my next partner will be surrounded by uh, yarrow was one time was yarrow and sure enough, it was. And so, um, you know, they can just give us so many messages. Um, I hope that's helpful. Another question came in. Um, how do you deal with doubt or lack of faith that comes up during practice? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's a really a big issue, particularly when people first start. And that's one, one of the reasons why it is important. If, if, if you're struggling with doubt, I strongly recommend that you go do a workshop or an in-person or you work with people who've had the experiences with the plants because it just gives you that extra confidence and support. Um, for me, doubts, doubt doesn't come in anymore when I work with the plants because I know, you know, the thing is, is that when you start to trust the, the messages or the experiences and they are verified as you go through, there's no reason to doubt because you just, you see, oh, they were, they were giving me good information here. Or the other way to, to go about it is to have a group of people communicate with the same plant. So um, when you're like, uh, in my classes, we will work with St. John's work. So if everybody in the class is communicating with St. John's work and they're each pulling out little nuggets here and there that match what I'm saying, it, it helps to verify that information. It helps me to trust what I'm hearing. So the, the, it's important that we engage with trust because as I said earlier, trust is one of those heart, positive heart impulses. And the more we can trust our environment and the more we can trust our world, the easier it is for us to be in that heart coherence and the easier it is for our nervous system to calm down. When we're not trusting, it's creating an energy leak. So, um, so if you're having issues with doubt, again, get with people, you know, get some support. And then you can always, I, I don't mind when people are doubting their experiences in my class. I always just encourage them to do, you know, what if, what if this plant was talking to me and go forward with it as if the plant was, and then see what happens. It's all an experiment. That's, you know, there's no right or wrong, just experiment and experience. What advice do you have for weeding and removing shrubs and trees? How do I make peace with ending a life? Yeah, that's a really challenging one. Um, particularly when it comes to trees, I often have that question of somebody who had to have a tree cut down and um, sometimes they'll be mourning about it over 10 years later. So the thing with plants, and, and even though this isn't part of the question I'm gonna put it in, is also the eating. Because I often, I've had vegans tell me, particularly when I was sharing the music of the plants device, they're like, oh no, I don't wanna know that plants are intelligent because then what could I eat? And so the thing is with plants is that they know their role in the great web of life. And they don't look at death the same way that we look at death. So this goes back to what have I learned from plants is they taught me a lot about death. And one of the biggest things that they taught me is that death is just a transformation. It's not the ending of anything new. It's a transformation of form. So, um, so if we need to weed what I do at my place, and, and if you saw my gardens, maybe you don't want my advice <laughs> because... Personally, you know, the weeds tend to be like some of the most nutritious, most wonderful plants. So I have plenty of dandelion and chickweed in my beds. And right now they're filled with uh, Lamium purpureum or dead nettles. And um, so I, I ask the plants and I let them know um, if I need to pull them, I let them know that I'm going to pull them. And I also will offer them a space where they can grow wild. So I'll say this, like, my garden beds, we have an issue with thistles here. And so it's like thistles need to stay out of my garden beds. However, I have huge areas where thistles can grow wild and I love them. I love to see the goldfinches go all over them. And same with bushes and trees. It's really important to let them know what we're gonna do ahead of time. And if possible to, to ask their permission. So um, we, we had an experience where we cut down a tree um, I thought we had permission for, but it was actually another tree. And so we, we, we always let the trees know that uh, 
we're going to cut you down and give them time and then also ask them what they need. And sometimes, um, sometimes there's things that we can do to help, to help make amends. And sometimes that's just not necessary. Helpful. Are there any other questions? I don't see any in chat. Pia, can you post the um, <clears throat> the, the URL for well, the uh, virtual weekend program in April? I'm so sorry. I, I when I introduced Jen, I got carried away that she was coming to us, even though I knew she was going to be doing this virtually. So I'm I'm going to turn that into my hope. That was a wish, <laughs> not a promise. A wish. <laughs> I think it would be lovely to be there. Yeah, Carrie, go ahead. Well, um, I. I am burning with a lot of questions. I just don't want to take up all the time. <laughs> but as long as you're asking and no one else is asking a question, then um, I'll pose this question. Um, we have, you know, we live in suburbia on a half acre. Uh, we are, as far as I can see, pretty much the only uh, property that has left any part of their property wild. And it's really quite small, but we have um, a lot of trees and we have this huge, you can't get your arms around it, a pin oak, very tall, quite spectacular, but cl close to the um, property line. And our neighbors uh, were upset with the bumper crop of acorns the year before, and it pinged their very precious vehicles. And they wanted us to take the tree down. And we're like, no, we won't be doing that. Um, uh, but long and short is, you know, the law allows neighbors to clear cut by their property line. So they ended up taking the branches off that were over their property. Um, I did my best to warn the tree, but I feel terrible about it. So how do I, you know, I don't know, <laughs> help the tree through it, I guess. Right. So I think, again, it's um, warning is great. You know, I have a similar um, experience and I'm sure everybody here has had something similar, but, but around here, it's that the, uh, for the electric lines, right? So I didn't plant the trees that, but the original owners planted a whole bunch of white pine trees right underneath the electric lines. So of course they get trimmed constantly. And I always feel so bad when they come through. Um, and unfortunately for them, I don't generally know when they're gonna, when it's gonna happen. So if you know ahead of time and you let the trees know, that's great. And then it also allows them to pull their energy out of those branches so that they're not, I mean, they'll do it instantaneously, but it just gives a little bit of a heads up. And then again, we can ask the trees, um, you know, what do you want? Like it's possible they need some help to recover from that. And it's possible that they don't. Um, I've had, uh, I've talked with our trees along the border here, and so far I've not needed to do anything to help support them. But I do always, like, while I don't know ahead of time when they're coming, I work from home. So when I hear that horrible noise, I go out and I like just kind of stand there and energetically support the trees and just, you know, let them know this is what's happening, bring your energy in, um, and, and of course always apologize. That leads into a question about um, how, what are ways to make amends? Well, again, that list is infinite. <laughs> so, and, and the number one thing is to ask the plant, you know, so, so I didn't get into the story, but I said that we, uh, we cut down a tree. And what happened here was that uh, the nature spirits showed me uh, what's a dead standing hemlock that we could cut down to make a uh, Hugo culture beds. And I sent my partner around, I showed him what, where the tree was and he started looking and then he started looking at the rest of the property and he's like, you know, there's another one that's by the road that I think would be better for us to cut down because one, it's less likely to provide habitat and two, 
that other tree, if we cut it down, it's gonna go into our neighbor's yard. So it would be easier for me to do this one. So I agreed and I didn't think anything of it. So then, I, but I noticed that as he was cutting down the tree, things started going wrong. Like his chainsaw broke twice and then he cut the tree and it wasn't falling. And then he eventually completely cut through the trunk and the tree still didn't fall. So now he's like pulling on it with a tow rope and it's not falling. And that's when I said, okay, give me a minute. Something's going on here. I need to talk with the tree. And when I did, the tree was really upset as were two of their neighbors, a white pine and a mulberry. And they were really upset because they said, this isn't the tree that you were told to take down. We didn't know you were gonna cut down this tree. And you know they were really shocked. So of course I was super apologetic. I felt so bad. And I said, what, you know, what can I do? And so they said, you know, just give us some time. They just needed some time to shift the energy a little bit. And then they told me to give some offerings and, um, and really what I needed to do was I needed to learn from the experience and remember that I have to pay attention to who they tell me to cut down. So that's what we did in that case is we gave offerings to the land. Um, and for my land, what I tend to give the nature spirits is a glass of port. Um, sometimes I'll give them uh, raspberries with honey or some food. But for um, other places and other lands and other plants, they might want something else. You know, sometimes it is planting something that's really beautiful there, or it's singing song, or it's lighting candles, or it's creating artwork for them. Um, the amends, there's just, there's no limit to it. And it's what's best is what the plants ask for. Another question is, how do we resist anthropomorphizing our communication with plants and trees? I don't want to project my own feelings or sensations on them if that isn't what they're saying. Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's a, a big thing that I hear, I've been hearing a lot. And so one is that we're humans and we totally can't clear ourselves of never anthro anthropomorphizing them because we're humans. It's like, it's the filter that it goes through. But the thing that I notice is that um, when I'm communicating with plants, they tend to use language um, differently than what I would say it for myself. So I'm still gonna interpret it. And, and the other thing is that the plants um, well, let me finish that first. I'm going to interpret it the way I'm going to interpret it through my filter, but I know that the language that's, that I'm hearing is not in my own head. So that also helps with the, the doubt part of it. It's like, oh, that's not, that's not me. I don't talk in that way. Now, the beauty of the plants is that they, they do understand us. So they, know, they don't always understand our limits. Like they don't always know that, hey, we have a mortgage we have to pay this month or I, I really need to eat right now or I need sleep at night. Like they don't always understand that, but we can let them know that. Like this is what I'm needing, but they do know how to relate to us a little bit. So I think sometimes they do relate to us through our emotions and through our feelings because that's how they know we can understand them and we can get it. So I'm not too, I don't get, um, some people really want, to, want it to be uh, clean and clear, like not have, as a human, not have any influence on the information that comes through. And I just think that's an impossibility. We're always, it's, it's the filter, it's gonna be there. And the key in um, my work, I, we do it a little bit in the plant communication, but it's more when I'm training practitioners is we just want to be what we call the hollow bone as much as possible. We want to get rid of our own filters, our own limiting beliefs, so that when we're in that heart space, which again is always where we want to communicate with plants. So when we're in that heart space, we're able to receive as pure information as possible. And how do you communicate with toxic plants? Oh, the same way. <laughs> So, you know, toxic plants are just as valuable and they're really important. One of my favorite plants and biggest allies is poison hemlock. You know, I love poison hemlock. Poison hemlock is, 
has taught me all about sovereignty and you know standing up as if you're a royal being and really just being who you are in this world and not caring what other people have to say about you you just you just be who you are so those um you know when we're communicating with plants it doesn't matter if a plant's poisonous, if a plant's invasive, if a plant's really nutritive. That might give us information on the plant, but every plant has gifts to offer. And so it, whoever's calling us, that's great. You might not want to eat the plant though. Let's just get it clear by that. If they're toxic, like poison hemlock, no, I'm not going to taste you. But, um, but I will communicate with um, poison hemlock in all the other ways. So how about during the winter when the snow is covering the plants? Is there still room for communi communication? Of course there is. It, it is sad. It is harder. It's like, you know, they tend to quiet down, but there's always those evergreens around us. So again, I have white pines all over here. That's probably why they're one of my big go-tos because they're there all year round. And, um, and it's usually winter when when I don't have as much time in nature or, um, or around the plant beings, that that's when I'm needing more like hope. <laughs> it's like, oh yes, yes, life will come around again. Um, but, you know, there, as Carrie said, there's house plants. So, um, you know, I have my, some of my allies here. I have snake plant over here and ZZ here. And so we can always communicate with them um, and connect with them. And then again, if we're using innocent perception, you know, it might not be the case if you're up in Alaska, but most places you can still find somebody growing somewhere. Like if there's a warm enough day, you know, dandelion pops out real quick. So you can, um, if you can brave the cold, there's usually somebody, there's moss is usually just glistening too in the winter. So um, you might find some new allies in the winter. That's all I have for questions right now. All right. It is getting towards ending time. Yes, yeah. Anybody else have questions? This is Carrie, you can go for it if you have more. <laughs> this is your opportunity. I'm here. Oh, I'm I'm really taking it in and mulling it over. And um, I guess I just want to mention a book, uh, Thus Spoke the Plant. Yeah. Uh, maybe you know, the, I'm sure it sounds like you might know the author. Uh, I don't know the author. So for others here, they may want to um, know that. But that my son gave me that book. In fact, my son, uh, who's 24 years old, is really becoming really into plants. And uh, he sent that book to me. And I just devoured it. I just loved reading about this plant researcher and her personal experience with uh, understanding plants. And it just um, gave me more faith in my own fairly limited experiences, but intuitions about plants. And so I appreciate your workshop and knowing that your program is virtual makes it a little more accessible to me. So um, I may see you in April and That'd maybe some folks. <laughs> That'd be great. So and yes. That's one, more, one more question has come in. What kind of advice do you give for those of us who are plant empaths who feel especially the despair associated with trees, global warming, human in, impact? Sorry, I just had to cough on that one. Um, that's a great question. So again, talk with the plants because again, the plants hold that long view. So it is, when it comes to global warming, it is the plants who give me the most faith in our future. And that show me that we are capable of way more than we think is possible. And during that time period in COVID where things shut down, we saw how fast nature is able to, to recover. Um, it happens way faster than what we can even imagine. So whenever I talk with the plants about it, that's what they're doing. They're telling me, they're showing me the different possibilities. They're showing me to keep hope and have faith. And again, they've lived through these really huge earth changes before. So they know how. So some of my favorite plants to work with for that are Eastern Hemlock because they're one of the pioneer plants that when the glaciers receded, Eastern Hemlock came in. Um, another one for where I live is Pawpaw. Pawpaw is really uh, mid-Atlantic area. 
It's another, it, technically pawpaw is a tropical plant but grows in the mid-Atlantic, so really helps with the adapting to climate change. So if you're listening to the plants, um, they tell us to have faith that um, all, all is well, all will be well, but we still have to do the work and, and it's possible. Um, I just wanna go back to Carrie and the book, Thus Spoke the Plant is written by Monica Gagliano. And um, we had talked about before I'm going to, uh, I have a resource list that I will put together and uh, Rose Center will send out to you with the recording so that we'll have more uh, books for reading because there's a lot of them. There's a lot coming out now about plant intelligence and it's all exciting and wonderful. And it's also saying exactly what all of our indigenous teachers and people who have lived close to the land have always known that plants are intelligent, plants are able to communicate and plants want to be in relationship with us. Um, but still, I love reading that. So if you're a book lover, um, I'll give you some more books. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. I'm looking. I'm so looking forward to seeing you, and I hope many of you as well um, on the on the weekend of the 28th. And if I can just put in one little commercial, we are having an on-site program in May that might be of interest to some of you as well, which is forest bathing with your dog. Which I'm really. I have a dog, and I'm really looking forward to that one as well. We don't usually let dogs onto our property, but for this, we will. So thank you again, and thank you all for coming.